I got to say, um, I love, love, love being with women. It is the coolest thing to be able to come all across the country and to just be with Christian sisters. I don't know many of you, but I do know you. That's how I feel when I come to retreats. I feel like I'm among my sisters. I don't come to retreats full of strangers. I feel like all of you are people that I already love, and that's the amazing bond that we have in Christ. And I just, I love doing this kind of thing. It's what I've dreamed of doing for a long, long time, and I just, I really, I, I love sharing God's word. It's such a joy. So uh, <laughs> we had a, a God moment today. I came by the building to make sure that the slides worked, and I got to say I was so proud of my PowerPoint. It's so pretty. The slides, aren't they so pretty? <laughs> Well, I had even taken a photo with my phone and sent it to my good friend. And I said, look at how pretty my PowerPoint is. It's so pretty. <laughs> it's like, have you ever seen these slides? So Lori pulls it up, and she had the same slides. <gasps> these are the exact same ones. We are totally thinking alike. So apparently you were meant to see these slides. <laughs> they are so pretty. <laughs> Such a pretty PowerPoint. So we're talking about transformed. You'll see little butterflies um, uh, at your tables. And I just want to tell you a couple things about butterflies. And as I talk throughout this weekend, um, we'll get to know each other. I'll tell you a little bit about me. And when we're visiting and fellowshipping, I hope you tell me a little bit about you. But I want you to learn a little bit about butterflies. Speaking of butterflies, these gals that got up here, it is not easy, right? It is hard to do. That was a great Devo. Those were awesome songs. It is not easy to put yourself out there in these kind of situations. And they, you guys have, you're so blessed with women who really have a heart for God. But um, in addition to the butterflies that they had, butterflies can be called a flutter. <laughs> That's what a group of butterflies is called. Did you know that butterflies taste with their feet? I didn't know that until I was researching it. Let's see here. Oh, forget that I said that. Okay, let's just start here. We're going to, I don't usually use slides. It's not teachery of me, but you'll bear with me. Um, these are our lessons for the week end. Tonight, we're going to talk about the renewing of the mind. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about transformational friendships, transformed by knowing God's will and transformed by the Holy Spirit. So now back to butterflies. Um, let's see. Worldwide, scientists estimate that there are between 15 and 20,000 species of butterflies. 750 of those species live in the U.S., some butterflies, of course you've seen them, they're as small as an eighth of an inch, while other butterflies, I don't think we have any in the U.S., have a wingspan of nearly a foot. They're pretty, but I don't want that one flying really near me. <laughs> of course, the scales on their wings give them that beautiful striking coloring, and each wing, as you know, is nearly symmetrical. Some species of butterflies have a gene inside of them that makes the identical markings on both sides. And if the butterfly doesn't have that gene, the markings will be similar, but not exactly identical. They have to possess that gene inside of them. They're amazing. But they don't live very long. The longest living butterfly is the brimstone butterfly, and it only lives nine to ten months. Did you know, I learned this from growing up in Colorado. Um, I lived in Colorado my whole life until five months ago when I, after 44 years, moved <laughs> to Middle Tennessee, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but growing up in Colorado, we would plant milkweed. And the milkweed is special because there are certain butterflies that have to lay their eggs 
on specific plants. Or that butterfly larva, when it hatches out of the egg, it can't survive. They can't just lay their egg on any plant. It has to be a specific plant. The monarch butterfly is the one that needs the milkweed. And so, you know, they have that great migration. And if along the way, let's say that we eradicated milkweed, there would also be no monarch butterfly because they have to have that. Their food source kind of determines their future. They lay their eggs on that and they, they're born and that's their food source. You know, the reason I picked butterfly, of course, for the theme of transformation is really obvious. They're not mentioned in the Bible. Butterflies are not, but I really can't think of a better example, can you, of Christian transformation. Think about butterfly for a minute. I mean, they start life as basically a worm. They're just a slimy, little, nasty, ugly thing with barely any power. I mean, how long would it take it for to cross over the table? It would take that little worm forever just to, just to cross the table. They don't have skills, really. They're just kind of hanging out, eating whatever they're near, I guess. But, you know, just like that little creature is the <laughs> Christian woman. In time, they undergo what I consider to be one of the most radical changes in all of nature. This little worm takes itself to a high place, and it may not be that high to you, but it was awfully high to the little worm that climbed there, climbs up, spins its little chrysalis or cocoon, digests itself. That's what happens when the, it's inside that little chrysalis. It literally, enzymes form, proteins come away from each other. They go into like a gut soup. And that from that gut soup, without any intervention from the outside world, all of the proteins reform themselves. And it is said, researchers believe that, that some, I, I can't even fathom this, that some of the little worms, like let's say something tragic had happened to it right before it became a butterfly, you know, like an ant stole its leaf piece or something, it can remember that after it transforms. That's amazing. That it goes into the gut soup and then all of those proteins and all of those enzymes reform themselves. And what happens? A butterfly. A thing that can fly comes out of the chrysalis full of color, full of diversity, full of beauty. And now, instead of just inching along the table, it can fly and taste with its feet. All the beautiful things that God intended for the butterfly to be. You know, just like the butterfly, though, Christian woman, our food source is really going to determine our destiny, isn't it? The things that we're eating are going to determine our transformation. We're going to talk about that this week a lot, about the things that we're eating, the food that we're eating when we're looking for transformation. Now, we already heard kind of the definition of transformation. I'll give it to you again. It means to change in appearance, nature, form, character, to metamorphose, just like a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly, of course, you know that that is precisely what Christ does in our lives. He takes, how many of you, I know all of you, started as a worm? I did. And through Jesus Christ and his amazing power, he is transforming us every day into a beautiful butterfly. But unlike that butterfly who has a short lifespan, we are blessed because our transformation is not just when we become a Christian. When you get the forgiveness and grace of Jesus Christ, you become a new creature, right? Scripture teaches that we are a new creature. But today, this weekend, we're going to kind of discover some ways that we can continue the transformation. We're not 
stuck just as the butterfly that Christ made at first. We can continually experience an ongoing transformation through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that makes us a more beautiful creature every single day because we become more Christ-like. So our text for this entire lesson, and you'll hear me refer to this text, I think in every lesson, it's kind of our, it's kind of our go-to place. Romans 12, 1 to 2, and you can really understand it as you read through it, why I chose it to be our kind of rock that we build lessons on. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I want you to focus specifically on the word conformed in verse 2. It, does, it says, do not be conformed. So what is conformed? Conformed is this. My kids play with Play-Doh. Uh, they don't now. <laughs> they might if you gave them some. Um, you know, we had, we had our, our little Play-Doh set was a farm, and we had, um, you could press, you know, you have the little mold, and there was a cow and a chicken and a horse, maybe, that was those little molds. And, you know, you press the Play-Doh in, and if you pull it out just right, Mommy, look, it's a green cow. Good job, sweetie. When you push that Play-Doh into the cow mold, what are you going to get? Cow. But is it a cow? Or does it just look like a cow? Being conformed is when we are pushed in to something and it looks like something else. Conformed is something that happens when we feel pressure and we yield to that pressure. If you pushed a rock into a mold, nothing would happen. We have to push Play-Doh into the mold because Play-Doh yields to the pressure and becomes the thing that, that it's conformed to. Now, being conformed to this world is pretty easy, isn't it? All around us, we are given opportunities to be pressed by the world pressed on all sides scripture says hard pressed on all sides the world is desperate just like those crabs desperate for you to look just like them and they will bring you down they will try so hard for you to look just like them and we're reminded that it is not our job to be conformed to this world but what are we supposed to be transformed transformed no wonder paul warns against it it is everywhere listen if you're wondering am i conformed to this world when you're conformed to the world you look like the world just like when we push that mold into the cow you're going to look like the world you're going to act like the world you're going to talk like the world and you know it's obvious even in my life that I've been squished. There's times when the Play-Doh is yielding and I'm looking like the world. I'm not the transformed woman that God has called me to be. I kind of go back to the worm girl. Nobody likes her, but the world does. The world wants something squishy and soft that it will yield to. Even with the redemptive power of Jesus Christ in my life, feel that squeeze I think you do too it's all around us you know worldliness is kind of one of those ambiguous words isn't it oh she's worldly well what does that even mean she's worldly I'll tell you a little story um, before I had my kids I was working in an office and um, we had a Jehovah's Witness family that worked for my company not my company but the company I worked for 
and um, she's about four or five, and I'm typing away, and we, it was a real family company, so her dad was in picking up his paycheck or something. She's bopping around in the back offices, and and she sees me. I'm typing, and I had painted my fingernails red. Of course, I thought I looked pretty good. And she's looking at my nails and looking at me. And she stops, and she says, Are you Jezebel? <laughs> Not quite, honey. <laughs> but to her, that's what she'd been taught. That was worldliness, right? Another time, I was speaking at Windsor. Um, my husband and I were at our, what we call our home congregation for 23 years before we moved five months ago. And I was, I think I had little kids during this time, but I was speaking at one of our events and I was wearing, I thought it was the cutest outfit. And my grandmother said, are you going to speak now? She goes, you don't have pantyhose. <laughs> and I'm like, well, do I have to have pantyhose? She goes, you get to Walgreens and you buy yourself some pantyhose. You're not speaking without pantyhose. And I'm like, okay, I go to Walgreens. When your granny says you go to Walgreens and buy pantyhose, you go to Walgreens and buy pantyhose. So I went to Walgreens and I spoke that lesson just so lovely because I had pantyhose. I was ready. I had no idea that was immodest. <laughs> you know, worldliness is something that I don't know if we can define it, but the problem is when I'm talking about worldliness, I'm usually talking about you. That's not where worldliness is found. When we're looking to see, am I worldly? We can't look at her or her, or her, we have to look at us. We have to look inside when we're trying to identify worldliness. Am I transformed or am I conformed? You know, you could eliminate a lot of worldly behaviors and still not be transformed. Because transformed is something that happens on the inside of you. And it will manifest itself in beautiful behavior on the outside of you. But we all know that we can go through the motions, we can sing the songs, we can pray the prayers, we can say all the right things. And there are moments when we're not transformed. We are conformed. I want you to listen to kind of a call for action for us for this weekend. I love this verse. I love Joel. Um, it's not a book we spend a lot of time in, but I want you to hear this. I want you to just like relax your shoulders. We're on retreat. Just like you kick your shoes off if you want. Just relax into this verse. Listen to what God says to Joel. Yet even now declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Tonight and this weekend, God is calling you to return. He's calling you to return to him, to leave the mold and to return. It is the lovely message from Genesis to Revelation. God has said, I want you to return. It's so beautiful. And that is what we're called to this weekend. Return. Return to God and look to him for transformation. Because you know, Think about this verse. It says, rend your heart and not your garments. Rend means to tear or rip violently. And when people would mourn, when Jewish people mourned, um, they would tear their clothes. They would tear their hair. And it would be an outward sign 
of weeping and, and terrible um, mourning, deep mourning. But you know what? God never was interested in what you had on. God doesn't care if you've got red fingernails or pantyhose. <laughs> what is he interested in from the first? Your heart. God has been in pursuit of your heart, friend, sister. He's been in pursuit of your heart since the day that you were born, since the day of creation. And this is where all of our transformation takes place. The Romans 12 transformation, this is where it takes place. It takes place from the inside out. If you're trans trying to transform from the outside in, it won't work. We have to transform from the inside out. Conformed, remember, is that that looks like the 3D mold. But transformed, transformed comes alive. I could push that. I could get glass and white Play-Doh, and I could squish it into that mold. It wouldn't be a green cow. It'd be a black and white cow, like the pretty cows outside my window in Tennessee. Would it be a cow? Would not. The magical, wonderful, spiritual transformation is that you, in transformation, become a new entity, living, breathing, alive, just like that butterfly that went in a worm and came out something completely new with new powers, new abilities new places to go, new visions, new goals, new dreams. That's what Christ does in the life of a Christian woman. The surrendered heart is where God wants us to be. So our call to action is surrender your heart, return to God this weekend to be transformed. You know, if we can't rely on our outward appearance, because aren't we all in a different place in our journey? My sister homeschooled her kids too, and they... We tried this, but ours died. I don't know why. Maybe neglect. We got the little, you know, you can order the little caterpillars, and they'll come, and you put them in the little tent thing, and they're supposed to go up and make their little chrysalises. Well, ours died, but my sisters, of course, lived. And, and um, But they were all in a different stage. It wasn't like the full moon came, and all the, the worms crawled up and became a, a, a butterfly at the same time. You know, it was like a process for each one. And as we're going through this transformation, we have to really watch that we're not comparing the journey of another woman to our journey. We kind of go through those stages, don't you think? I mean, in my life going through the things that I've gone through, I know that I'm transformed in Christ. I'm not saying that I've you know, that I don't have that transformation. But it's kind of an ongoing process, isn't it? You go from worm to gut soup. I mean, how many of you are in like a gut soup stage, like full chrysalis, right? <laughs> right? Some of us are right there in the gut soup place where you're like, it's dark and I don't see my way out of here. <laughs> I've been there many times in my Christian walk. And we cannot be judging the women, the women around us being like, she's been in that chrysalis for like forever. <laughs> but my sister's butterflies, they would crack out, like one would crack out and be flying around, the kids were so excited. And then a couple days later, another one would crack out. And pretty soon they had like seven in there. And they did this cute little video and sent it to me and all the butterflies <laughs> flew out of their little thing to their new life. But that's something to think about. Sometimes you look at the speaker and she, you know, she seems like she has it all together. Not this one. But sometimes that happens. And, um, you know, you're, you're looking around at the older women and you think, man, she, nothing ever happened to her. She's, just, she's got it down. And you're thinking, my kids are crazy or my marriage is off the rails or my job is so difficult. I've been so down. Everyone's on a different journey. And through the power of grace in Jesus Christ, oh, look at what we have. 
we have the power through Christ to transform into something new. So let's think about where we find the solution to all of this. Um, we, we don't want a Kool-Aid stain on our white t-shirt. We don't want our worldliness to just show up that much. Thank goodness I didn't spill Kool-Aid. That would have been something I would do. But thank goodness we didn't spill Kool-Aid tonight. I might have stained it on my shirt, but we don't want the worldliness inside of us to leave us stained. But let's go inside the chrysalis. And what do I mean by that? Inside the chrysalis is inside your mind because that's where transformation takes place, right? It's what we think that becomes who we are. So in our key verse, we can back up to that. Um, we're going to look at the next word, transformed. By what? The renewing of your mind. We reject being molded by the world, and instead we pursue transformation into a full new creature inside the chrysalis. Your mind is like that shell where all that changing is going to take place. It's really hard to put it into practice, however. It is really hard to rein in that mind when things get really tough. I saw on Facebook, which is the source of all knowledge, um, it said, don't believe everything you think. Isn't that good? Sometimes I don't think the very best things. And I have a chrysalis mind. And I can choose at that moment, am I going to, what am I going to become? You've all seen like weird deformed butterflies that can't fly. We've seen moths that aren't as pretty as other butterflies. What are you going to become if, if what happens up in here? And this weekend, I hope that through some of our lessons, we kind of help the mind go toward transformation and away from confirmation. The kind of transformation, I really want to I really want to emphasize this point. The kind of transformation that we're looking for is not an exchange of one set of rules, the rules for the worm, in exchange for the rules for the butterfly. God wants us to replace the works of the flesh with the fruit of the spirit. I think I have, oh, I don't have Galatians, I don't think. We'll go back to this one. Galatians 5, 19 to 23. You guys know this verse. I know you do. It's about the, the fruit of the spirit. Now, this is the story. I want you to imagine as we read this, this is the story of the worm who turned into a butterfly. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, so we'll call our little worm deeds, all right? Here's deeds. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy. He's an ugly worm. Outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarned you and I have forewarned you that those who practice such things, worm-like behavior, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen to what the verse in Galatians says about transformation. But the fruit of the Spirit is, you know it, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. That's the butterfly. But I want to point something out. We're supposed to replace the, the deeds of the worm with the beauty of the fruit of the Spirit. And that sounds easy, doesn't it? Just exchange one for another. Stop it already. Just stop being bad. Stop sinning. You ever tried that? I don't do it very long. I'm telling myself at the beginning of the day, I'm going to stop sinning today. And then I get right back into it. You know, for a long time, I mean, I've been a Christian. I was raised in the church. So it's hard to say, like, 
I know when Christ added me to the church and when I became covered in his grace. I know that day. I know when that happened. But I was raised in the church. I've been, I feel like I've kind of been on the, on the road to transformation really my whole life because my parents kind of set it for me. So here's me. I'm growing in Jesus Christ. I'm growing in his grace. And I am trying so hard to get it right. And I keep failing. Have you been there? Like, I just can't get it right. And it's sort of like when I try to fit into my pants. Like, <laughs> TMI. Um, if they fit down here, then there's like a little bit puffing out the top. And if you stuff the bottom down, then this is part is too tight. And you're just... You're just so uncomfortable and you want your yoga pants. That's what it feels like to wrestle with sin, right? You're like, I got this right. I'm not going to gossip. I'm not going to gossip. So I like swoosh the gossip part in. I've got that under control. And then it's like bubbling out the top and I'm complaining. I'm like, I cannot get this right. And so I'm putting in more and more effort, right? I'm putting in effort. I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better. I'm going to be more kind and good and faithful and self-controlled. And it was like my whole life I missed the point of Galatians. Tell me, whose fruit is it? Yes. All the time, Kelly was trying to create fruit when it is the Spirit who creates fruit. See how the focus changes? When we switch from the things that we do, the checklist, to the things that the Spirit does, that's really the power of transformation. We're going to have to rely not on our works, but on our God who works. Stop relying on your own works to get it done. Remember this. You know the whole thing. God, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? You've got the Trinity. We talk about how it's like an egg. You have the, the shell and the white and the yolk. Our God cannot be cut into pieces, my friends. And when you... When you're indwelled with the Holy Spirit, you're not indwelled with a third of God. You're indwelled with all of him. God doesn't show up in pieces and parts. He shows up in wholeness. I mean, that's amazing and profound. That we have the power of God indwelling in us to do something like make a worm into a butterfly. We're going to be fueled this weekend by the Holy Spirit by pressing in real close. Press real close to God. Because that's where that transformation is. That's where that power is. You could press real close to the written words in your Bible. In fact, instead of a pillow, tonight, sleep on your Bible. Your face will be conformed. <laughs> but your heart won't be transformed, will it? We have to press in close to the power that's here for us to have. We want to mold ourselves into God's person so that he can change us. I told you that the caterpillar digests itself to become a butterfly. We got to be real careful that if you see another woman and she's kind of in the gut soup stage, that you encourage her. Girl, you've got this. Think about it. You have all of God indwelling you. Put some courage back in her that she is going to be beautiful. We got to walk the valley. We got to stay in the chrysalis sometimes. Think about our key verse. It ends with this. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is and that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Here's something I never thought of before I studied for this lesson. Butterflies are living proof of God's will. 
God's will for you, my Christian sister, is for you to undergo a change into the likeness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us that we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord to the Spirit. It's as if by looking on his face daily, continually, by pressing close to our power source, we are going to become more like him. But renewing of the mind is not just talked about in Romans. We've got it in Ephesians too. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 says that in reference to your former life, that's your worm, that's your worm, you lay aside the old self. It's like the Bible wrote the lesson for me. I mean, look at this which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit that, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. God's will for you is that you lay aside the caterpillar life and become a butterfly. All right. So we get it. Okay, Kelly, we want to be transformed. Tell us how. How do I go into the chrysalis and come out a butterfly? But however, asking how implies that you will be doing the work. And we just learned from Galatians that it is the spirit who works. So we, we can do two things. We can do two things that will help the spirit work in our life. And we're going to be transformed in these two ways. Prayer. This is kind of the how question. Prayer is the answer to the how. It's, it's like it's forging a partnership with God. It's a surrender in which we say, I realize that my only source of transformation is you, and I want you to work in my life. It's not a bullet point. It's not a checklist. I prayed today. It's a desire to press close, to be in community with the Holy Spirit, with God, who is our source of transformation. Prayer is a verbal, emotional, and physical commitment to a partnership in which you will be transformed. Now, you're going to hear me say this beauty word right here, submission. For us women, especially younger women, we're like, no, I hate that word. I hate submission. But I hope that at the end of this retreat, you love it because I love it. You will see what it will do in your life. Submission is to see God's commands through the eyes of a butterfly and not a caterpillar. We cannot see our own desires in the word submission. We can only see the desires of our Father. We see the commands, his commands, any command that you're going to find in the Bible. Are you ready for this? Any command. Are you ready? Any command. You will find that he commands and the eyes of the butterfly see it through totally different eyes. We are not looking through the hungry eyes of the worm, but through the eyes of the butterfly. And that's where the spirit works. When we submit to the word from the inside out, if we refuse to submit to the word and the will of God, he cannot transform us. However, we know the word's important, but education and study alone, can that transform us? Listen, atheists study the Bible. People that hate Christians study the Bible. Are they transformed? It is not the black and white words of scripture that transform. It is the power behind the words that transform. Listen, you cannot transform yourself any more than a mouse 
could sit on the edge of a little stump and transform himself into a falcon. It won't happen. We have a power source in the word of God, and we must learn to pursue. What does pursue entail? Ch- to chase, to, in, it, to um, intentionally find, pursuit. It's, it's always peeking around the corner. Are you there, God? No? Let me look over here. Are you here, God? I almost saw you. Maybe you're over here. Pursuit takes this intentional effort, and we have to pursue God through his word. If we pursue God in ways that he didn't ordain, we will never find him. We'll just be lost. The words on the paper will not change a caterpillar into a butterfly, but the living, breathing person of God who breathed the words on the paper, that's who will transform us. Finally, and I'm almost done. She was worried I was going to go too long. She was going to give me the cutoff. (laughs) Finally. We have got to stop thinking like a worm, right? When you think like a worm, you're going to act like a worm. And transformation begins with the renewing of the, the mind. Yep. This means that we are literally going to take our thoughts into the chrysalis, right? Second Corinthians, write it down. I should have a slide, but I don't. Second Corinthians 10.5, it literally says, take your thoughts captive. Now, if I had some toilet paper and I brought Lori up here and I wrapped her up in toilet paper, would she be my captive? She could just break out of there. We'd be so impressed by her strength. (laughs) But if I got chain or rope and some cinder blocks, I could make anybody my captive. Sometimes it's going to take that to get your thoughts captive. I learned something like this. When I have a worm thought, you all know what they are, and yours are different than mine, they're going to take the same track. They're going to say, let's be like the world. You can't do that. You're not pretty. You're not as pretty as her. You're not as smart as her. You can't do anything. You're not worthy. Your marriage is not going to work out. Your kids are going to be miserable. Your grandkids, they're lost. This is what the world's going to say to you. All right, I want to teach you the theory of next. This is what you do. You identify the thought and you say, next. (laughs) You know, as a public speaker, you can be really self-conscious. You know, what are they going to think of me? And I'm quirky. And what if they don't like that? And or what if I say something stupid, which I just plan on it. (laughs) Then it's okay. (laughs) But you get really self-conscious and and you, you think things. I'm telling you, moving to a new place as the minister's wife, you really feel like you're under the microscope. I'm at a new church. I've been at the same church for 23 years, and I'm, I'm at this new church, and I really have felt that feeling of everyone is literally looking at me, and guess what then they're doing? They go home like, what do you think of that new preacher's wife? They do it. I promise you they all do it, and they do it in a nice way because they're, hopefully they're like, oh, she was so nice. I think she's going to be so great. I hope that's what they're saying, but you know it's happening. It just is. I know it's happening. Listen, I had some really tough days. Our, we moved into this cabin, and I thought, let's go and fill. It's like Little House on the Prairie. I was going to be pioneer. <laughs> It's an 1850s log cabin. Now, it's been kind of redone inside, like, in 1980. (laughs) It looks good. (laughs) Anyway, it's cool. It's cool. Everybody's like, oh, I'm so jealous that you get to live there. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be great. So we have an infestation of brown recluse spiders. They're in my kids' beds. They're on the floor. They're on your body. They are everywhere. There's no light fixtures. So everything's just a lamp. You know how frustrating it is when it's nighttime and you can't even see to fold clothes. 
because I didn't bring like 500 lamps. And like it only gives off light in this one little spot. So I'm like trying to fold underwear, holding them up. Oh, those are Cameron's. <laughs> and, um, those are Connor's. <laughs> it's, there's so many things about it that are just miserable. We have all the spiders. Okay, so we had, right before we moved in, no one had lived there for a year. And no one's even really supposed to live there. It's just meant to be an entertainment type place. <laughs> but we live there. And um, we're just renting it while we build a house. So I know it's temporary, I'm gonna get through it. But sparrows, hundreds, it sounded like hundreds, built <laughs> their nests in the eaves of our house. And at 4 a.m., those hundreds of baby sparrows, they don't make a tweet, a sweet little song. They're like, ah, 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 at like 4 a.m. every day. So if you don't get killed by the spiders, then we had a bee infestation and a wasp infestation. And there were mice and there's armadillos. <laughs> and they're so gross and they're running by you in the night. And oh my goodness. I was having some warm thoughts. <laughs> I'm like, what have I done? <laughs> worm and it started like just the circumstance started to go pouring into my thoughts I was saying to myself what evidence do you have that they don't like you they threw me a party when I got there like a shower I had a table loaded with gifts from all of them to say welcome my pantry was stocked my fridge was stocked there were fresh towels in my bathroom there was a shower curtain there was hand soaps in, in the bathroom. I mean, they wanted me there. And yet I'm like thinking worm thoughts. So here's what you do. When circumstances have you thinking the worm thoughts, you know, oh, they don't like me. They're not going to like me. I'm too weird. Next. No, I'm not going to think that way. And neither will you. You use the next principle. It brings us right back to the beginning of the verse, which says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, it's making a noise. I think, is it running out of battery? Okay, okay it's just beeping, that's good. <laughs> by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. It is in our transformed lives that we can offer up our butterfly to God as a holy sacrifice he accepts that which he alone has transformed and this life as a butterfly is our sacrifice and our worship beauty lies in the transformation of the Holy Spirit in his power to change us we will change if we press close to the Holy Spirit from a worm into a glorious creature that is equipped to do his will. This weekend, I want you to escape the lives and the demands that you have at home. I know you're going home, but try to escape, to make some space in your mind that's available space. Clear up the disk space so that you can lean into Jesus, so that you can return to him. Lean in, press close, and allow him to transform you. I will see you in the morning. I can't wait to be with you tomorrow for our next lesson, which is transformed by friendship. Thank you very much.